So we welcome you all as part of our community on this important occasion. Lord, behold us and our community. Grant that as we come in thankfulness, so we may reflect respect for the past and stand in hope for the future. Amen. The um, war memorial, mm -hmm. do you remember that being put up? Yes, my father and them, I remember the things lying in our house, the um, laurel wreath and the sword. Shall we go and look at it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so who actually built the memorial? Uh, well, my father and my uncles, because I remember the things lying. The, the war started. Doug was stationed up in Lerwick. Well, I had five years in the patrol service. And at that time, I was uh, <laughs> a very raw recruit. And I wasn't because I had been very poorly. I'd had pneumonia <clears throat> previous, just a year before, and I wasn't allowed in the forces. So there was these four naval officers stationed in Lerwick. They had a house, a flat anyway. So I spent my war, that was my war service, was looking after them. And I had seen it, the sailor, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's a stranger. So I said to one of the officers, you see, uh, Lieutenant Commander Hewitt, I said, have you got a new man over there? He said, uh, yeah, yes, we have, as a matter of fact. I says, oh, and that was it, you see. Well, I don't know if it was the same day or the following day, there was a ring at the door. And when I opened the door, who's st standing there but this sailor? He says, I'm, I'm over from the RT station. He says, I believe the radio is not going. I says, oh, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, if they've sent you over, <laughs> you may as well come in and, <laughs> and tend to the radio, wasn't it, I think? Yes, uh -huh. radio. Uh -huh. So that was the start of it. Yes. That was how it was engineered, and that's yeah. how I landed in Sea Houses. I got into the Royal Navy, and uh, the what were my poor health, and I was classed as unfit for small craft, but they gave me a shore job. And uh, that's where I met my wife, and uh, you see, I wasn't a young man, I was. I was, I was 30 year old then, the mess of the lads in Wogang was uh, in my twenties and were making another, you know, and I had been petal pump at 10s and were making another well. I was on a scheme in 1942, 1941, 42, going into 43, or teaching coxswains for land coffee, see, things like that, well, there was a lot of them never had been to say their life, man. Yeah, the other ones of them, you know, and uh, it, it used to be laughable, some of them, the way w they went alongside, uh, they had to cut a dash, you know, and go full speed. <laughs> I wondered why the great muckle fender was always on the bows. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> However, uh, what, one thing or another, we managed to struggle for. Yeah. Aye. Let us remember before God and commend to his sure keeping those who have died for their country in war, those whom we knew and whose memory we treasure, and all who have lived and died in the service of mankind. When I became 17, my father, of course, he was born in the army and he wanted to know when I, wanted, when I was going to join up, there was a war on, and so I went into the army and um, I joined up at, um, actually, we went to Kukubri, and then uh, we dished out to, I went down to Catholic to the Royal Armoured Corps to drive, to learn on tanks, become a ta um, tank crew. We come back from there, and we went straight out to Pune in India. Bombay and then on to Pune. When I left school, I was in the shop till I went away when I was 20. And then I came back when I came out to the Navy, helped them with, and just stayed, 
I just stayed there after that. My brother, he was five years in the army. He was uh, with the Desert Rats, uh, military police. He went to the Del Alamin, he went through that lot. I went to Sicily and then came back here for the invasion. He went over there and he finished up in Germany. I went there and of course these different specialists were sent to different regiments to do work for them. But I, uh, like I said, I went out to Pune and back into the Royal Armoured Corps. So uh, while I was there, uh, I was trained to be a tank commander. We once had a spy. He came to the cottages, he was looking for lodgings. And he said that he wouldn't be any problem because he, would, he slept most of the day but um, he worked at night and he had this torch, huge torch. It was normal, red and green. And um, he was letting us kids play with it, you know, we're switching it on, switching it off and so forth. So the, the women folks said, well, why don't you go to Christen Bank way over the fields, you know? That'll be your best bet, there's more houses there. I mean, there were farm cottages that couldn't take him in. And, um, a few days after we heard that caught him, he was out at night signalling to the German planes. He was a spy. <laughs> that was a bit of excitement as well. <laughs> but um... I remember one day uh, there was a mine went off along the, the, the north road there, just down from the dunes. And they were, they were touring this mine across the rocks with a wagon. Unfortunately, everybody was back because the mine was, was nearly up under the cliff when it went off and the blast went up height, you see, to clear the, the uh, top of the cliff. And everybody was okay, but it shot up quite a few windows. <laughs> well, I, I certainly remember the war, but it was only from the point of about 1944 onwards. Well. We saw plenty airplanes and things like that, you know, German airplanes and things. The Longston was bombed, and uh, I think one of the one of the notable Germans cost here one night. And he came straight over the the harbour master's house, and straight up the yard, and we have such a. Near the horse's drinking trough, we had such a high post, I don't know how on earth he missed it. No, and when he got up over the field, he went down out of sight. What he was so low. What did you see? Just see him. We saw his hands on the wheel, and he was looking down like this, going up. Could you see what he was wearing? Yes. Lovely gauntlets he had on, they were right up to his elbows, and the fur round here, and his ears was covered up. and. He was looking down at us. Mm -hmm. We could see him, I knew it was him, by seeing him on the television. And what about the plane? Was there anything special about oh, the plane? Oh yes, we saw the swastika. That's how we knew it was a German plane. Mm -hmm. And what, what did you say when you saw this? What did you think? I think we were mesmerised. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be quite frightened, I would think, at the yes, time. Yes, we, we were. We were, because he could have shot us easily. He was so near, he could have shot us. Uh -huh. and did, you, did you find out later where he was going? Oh, yes, it was in the papers. Yes, see the Duke of Hamilton. Somewhere about the clue, wasn't it? No, it was further west. Oh, uh -huh. I think it's in Argyle, actually. Mm -hmm. mm. He actually crossed um, from the Fyle Islands Past the Seafield yes, Farm. Yes, that's what he had taken his in, in, well, to come over, so Mr. Hargo said. He had seen the islands. Uh -huh. And then he went on as far as uh, the Duke of Hamilton's estate. Yes, it was nearly straight away. Yes, he actually crash landed. When the war finished, we, um, we went to Singapore, we saw all the men coming out of Changi Jail. Some of them are local my friends, some of them from Belfast, and those some of them from here. 1939 to 
Richard Archbold of the Royal Navy, MTB, died, English Channel. Thomas Bradford, Pioneer Corps, Normandy. William Coates, Royal Signals, Italy. We were in Yarmouth, staying in these big private houses. And come in this day and we were all lined up on the street. And he said, uh, either wanting to see the lot of you, one or two at a time, went in. And this bloke sitting, he says, uh, was wanting volunteers for the paratroopers. The canopy. He says, aye. So we went and had a look, sure enough. Oh, I says, I cannot off me as an able seaman. I'm no longer an able seaman. I says, I'm waiting to go to wherever I'm sent, to uh, the general service. So I went up and saw about it, and the bloke says, he says, oh, he says, you should be in a way to Devonport. So I, I believe that the lads that were all in that dock landed into Singapore just as the Japs seized it, the world captain. So that was another time, just by fate, I escaped. But it was weird, you know. Uh, weird. Uh, Cecil McCaskey, Leicestershire Regiment, Italy. Douglas Morton, Noel Northumberland Fusiliers, England. John Moore, Northumberland Hussars, Normandy. Matthew Norris, 3rd Carboneers, Burma. I was having my dinner at the time, and I can remember saying to my father, I think that was an explosion. And he hadn't heard it, he said, I never heard it. But mind, he heard the next one a few seconds later. I was at school. At the playtime, we watched it come along. Because there wasn't all the houses between the school and the harbour. But there are now. And we stood and watched it bla burning. It was just like the photo, I've seen a photo of the, of the blast. And it was just like a photo of an atom bomb going up. All this smoke and all that sort of thing. And at lunchtime, I used to go to my auntie's work. She lived right on the shore, more or less. And uh, there was just the road and a bit of grass and on the beach. It was right in front of her window. Long way out, of course. And my brother was five. He just started school. He went out to have a look. And mother went upstairs to shout to him. And fortunately, just she, she didn't get to the top of the stairs when it blew up. There was just this huge flash and this big bang. And that was the end of the Somali. Because the glass blew right out the bedroom window and it would have cut her all to pieces. It cut the bedspread, everything was cut. It just shot across the bedroom. Uh, one of the soldiers grabbed him and lay down flat with him. But uh, everything was spoiled because the fire blew out and it was all over the table. The place was full of soot. It did cause a lot of damage and a lot of the ceilings were, were shattered a bit, you know, and they were all loose after that. People had to get new ceilings put up. And, it did cause quite a bit of, bit of bother when it blew up. Actually, I went down to the harbour after that and I went out in one of the, one of the boats and we went up towards it. But uh, there was quite a lot of stuff floating and we came back again. Cigarettes that washed up, millions of cigarettes. I think the folk in Newton had all their floorboards up and they had the cigarettes under the floorboards. And pencils. Um, there and was drugs bowl. on, Chinese money, drugs, I don't know what else. We just waited till the lifeboat came in. The lifeboat was underneath that ship's stern when it blew up, you know. Yes, they were lucky, weren't they? They were very lucky. Mm -hmm. Alan Spence, RAF, 1943, not known. Roland Sunter, glider pilot. England, Thomas Trotter, QSB, Burma. We're living on a knife edge now. It only takes a couple of madmen to set off a few atom bombs and you know what would happen. You say what happened at Chernobyl there. The full consequences of that has not been realised yet. 
for man is always still on the hard way. And by the time he learns, it's too late. So, what the future is, I, like Robbie Barnes, I doubt and fear. <laughs>